just maybe one more minute before we get started so that uh, we have a few more folks who are waiting to join. Okay, now it's okay? Now it's okay. Perfect, all right. Okay, some technical uh, breakthroughs <laughs> here and there. All right, so today's a, a important day in terms of uh, looking into the future of uh, AI and its applications. Um, uh, and before we go into that, and before I introduce uh, uh, the presenter, uh, some of the features of the Grand Rounds, as you would know, it's uh, shared on the website. Uh, and uh, for the CME credit for the session, please text 12465 at the number 888-816-4893. This is a customary number that you have to um, send your SMS message, and you can do that within the 12 hours after the completion of the session for your uh, active uh, profile in Redgear CME Cloud to be able to get a CME credit, and it should be the mobile number. And also for the uh, maintenance of certificate uh, points for a physician, uh, please complete the CME step. And then this link, which will also reappear on your chat box later on. And this time the room code is future 16 for you to take up some of the questions. And if you answer them correctly, you'll have your MOC point directly populated to your ABIM website. Obviously you need your ABIM and your cloud CME to coexist. Uh, under the same setting. All right, so with that, uh, it's my privilege uh, to uh, present the uh, guest speaker for today, and it's David Oyan. David is uh, one of the most uh, uh, prolific upcoming um, stimulating researcher in AI and imaging. Uh, David, uh, the stage is yours, and thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, Partha, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be uh, chatting with everyone here. Let me share my screen. The title of my talk is Cardiovascular AI. Also, as Partha has mentioned, I'll primarily focus on echocardiography and applications of deep learning, um, but really kind of describe the full gamut from development to deployment. And the fundamental framework of this talk will be kind of discovered. Why is artificial intelligence and deep learning particularly exciting? What is unique about this particular moment in time? The development, what it means to actually develop artificial intelligence algorithms specifically for cardiovascular imaging. And then what does it look like? What does it look like when it's using used for disease detection? And ultimately, what does it look like when it comes to deployment? And these are my disclosures. I have a little bit of uh, industry work. First, regardless whether one is a cardiologist, a radiologist, dermatologist, pathologist, or just uh, any physician in general, uh, one recognizes that there's significant value in medical imaging. On the left-hand side is a picture published in the New England Journal almost tw uh, 10 years ago, which actually shows a truck driver. Over the course of 30, 40 years of potentially driving the same route where the sun's shining in the morning and not shining in the afternoon, there's asymmetric exposure that causes asymmetric features to generate from the left and the right. And this really details what I think is the fundamental dogma of medical imaging, which is the environment plus inheritance, this gentleman is Caucasian, creates a phenotype, which we can see where kind of one side of the face is more wrinkly than the other, that is visualized by imaging. In this case, just visual imaging, but we know that we have much more advanced and sophisticated technologies, including ultrasound and MRI, that leads to clinical outcomes, right? Skin cancer in this case. This is a framework that works in all kinds of medical imaging, particularly cardiovascular imaging. While physicians are really good at assessing the key features, things like the ejection fraction or coronary calcium on CT or uh, gadolinium enhancement on MRI. Really, those are just the human lens to a rich and complex data set, a human lens to recognizing that there's a lot of visual information, but potentially we're not capturing it all. And ultimately that's the opportunity and the excitement around deep learning. This is an opportunity to get 
software and computers to look at what is the most relevant feature. It might not be the things, or it might be the things that humans really care about, but ways to really expand our understanding of the relationship between the imaging to the clinical outcomes. And rather than a picture of a face, really this highlights that right now, the way that we interpret medical imaging is like the tip of the iceberg. We recognize that there is tremendous information that is still remaining and still needs to be seen, um, but really isn't. And we're hoping that with more research and more advanced algorithms, we can hopefully find that in the future. And ultimately, um, there's many terms that really talk about the newest algorithms, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, um, many ways to describe it. Um, but I'll focus my talk on deep learning, which I'll use colloquially just to say it's AI. It, they are slightly different phrases, but ultimately deep learning is some of the things that I find most exciting and where the popular literature has found the most interest over the last five, 10 years. It's everything that's really built into things like self-driving cars and really is able to do tasks that weren't able to be done even 10 years ago. For example, distinguishing kind of parakeets from uh, uh, guacamole um, is hard without a deep learning network because it looks like the colors are very similar, the textures may not be meaningful, um, but really it is with more sophisticated algorithms, one can really distinguish between very similar or subtle looking features. And really that's why I think imaging is particularly exciting. And before I talk specifically about echocardiography, um, really what, the, what we're seeing is that with structured data, AI isn't necessarily the most useful thing or is, not, is only incrementally beneficial, um, but there's a tremendous already um, advances and opportunity with things like XGBoost or random forest or lasso or even logistic regression. But imaging is the opportunity to have an unbiased approach where maybe we don't know what are the most meaningful features. Maybe we haven't measured all the individual things in an image, but can we actually look at the texture or can we actually use the image and go directly to the outcome that we're looking for? And I'm a huge nerd, so I often begin with this slide, which is kind of describing the opportunity is really there when we are using images of any sort of whether it's the sort uh, evaluated by a dermatologist or pathologist or a cardiologist, which is if it looks like text or if it looks like structured elements in a CSV file or uh, a spreadsheet, often traditional statistics are sufficient or already goes most of the way there. But deep learning is an opportunity when there's just so much data. And this is the paradigm that we're living in now where as physicians, we're inundated with the information, um, but maybe, the most important features or the most relevant information is something that we still um, haven't fully captured. And we see this is the paradigm that really it has already existed in cardiology, particularly cardiovascular imaging, whether it's echocardiography or nuclear imaging or MRIs or CT, um, there's a lot of progress already being made using deep learning. And I, use the term imaging broadly. It just means unstructured information where we've seen kind of on the top right, um, colleagues at Google have even used things like fundoscopic imaging, imaging of the eye to show that that has a strong relationship with cardiovascular risk. And even things like um, EKGs can be interpreted in some ways as images because we were really looking at essentially the structure and the, the shape of the waveforms that really help us determine anything, many things from STEMIs to uh, other indications. So the vision of what well, I would say my lab, as well as what many people like Partho as well as others are looking at is machine learning of cardiovascular imaging allows for precision phenotyping. And this allows for the future potentially additional prognostic or diagnostic utility. In simple terms, is it possible to let machines do what humans do, but potentially faster or more precisely? Or is it possible to get machines to do tasks that humans cannot do? And this is uh, the opportunity and potentially the, the path of future development in deep learning. And as I continue to talk about deep learning, first I wanna take a step back, which I wanna recognize that the human element is the biggest source of variation in interpretation. 
I'm sure as kind of physicians, you guys recognize and this is the value of morning reports and this is the value of kind of m ms is that when you talk to three different physicians, you might get four different interpretations. This is both true of complex clinical presentations as well as imaging. Whereas we've done an analysis with using some of the algorithms that I'll describe um, in a little bit. But if there's even slight differences of human interpretation, even slight differences in how you contour or trace the left ventricle, that can cause big changes in assessment of the ejection fraction. And this is true even looking at the same images and that society um, in blindest studies have shown that there is significant human to human variation. Ultimately, variation in interpretation of imaging at this point isn't purely based on the signal to noise ratio of the actual imaging modality, whether it's hard to see the edge of the wall or not, but really how humans measure it. And this is particularly true for echocardiography, where even for something as basic as ejection fraction, one of our most fundamental measurements and things that echo is synonymous with, has is fraught with human level resolution as opposed to the detail, whether it's the spatial and temporal resolution of how we interpret that imaging. The way I describe it is that on the left-hand side is actually the distribution of ejection fractions from the ECHO database from both Stanford as well as Cedar sinai in which we see that they're colored based on whether the report actually ended with a five or zero humans tend to choose round numbers because we're not so precise. We're, we actually gravitate to maybe that EF is 50% because we wanna say it's right on that border between mildly reduced and normal. Or maybe we wanna say exactly 35% because we're not sure if the patient deserves an ICD or not. But this is not how natural um, organs actually de develop. On a population level, we don't see that the left ventricle has big peaks or are just much more common to have this variation just at these small kind of thresholds. And this is true when we actually look at the information on the right-hand side, which this is not true when it's um, actually measuring the end systolic volume or the end diastolic volume. This shows that human clinicians use more than just the imaging to come up with the conclusions, uses essentially human gestalt and evaluation to come up with their interpretation. And that is really where kind of expertise is important, but also variation comes in. Society guidelines, the American Society of Echocardiography recommends averaging up to five consecutive beats, particularly for patients with AFib, to especially smooth out some of these differences, right? If there's significant RR variation, an EF might look very different from one beat to the next. But really, I would say in a busy clinical practice, most physicians don't do that. It's very hard and it's laborious and it's tedious to trace ejection fraction for five beats or to really um, do a very tedious manual effort to do some of the evaluations. That said, even something as basic as ejection fraction is really crucial. It is, as I mentioned, the gateway to deciding whether um, a patient needs goal-directed medical therapy for heart failure or deciding whether a patient gets a, a therapy such as a valve surgery or an ICD for a particularly low ejection fraction. This is in tension with the fact that ultimately we do recognize that there is continued and there is significant variation in our assessment of the ejection fraction. And Finally, before I move on and really talk about what AI actually looks like, this is true even in other imaging modalities. So on the left-hand side is actually a paper published by Augusto et al. in 2021, last year, which shows that this is equally true for cardiac MRI. More than the difference between SNR or signal to noise ratio between MRI and echo, it's really human variation in how we trace even something as simple as wall thickness actually has significant variation. And that variation is much more provider to provider than machine to machine or study to study. That's really where we can get the biggest gain and show the biggest difference in understanding if someone's really changed from now to six months from now, or if there's a significant clinical uh, indication for more aggressive or less aggressive therapy. So I hope I've convinced you that there is a need that medical imaging, while has gone really far and has a lot of opportunity, still um, can go even further and still needs more refinement. And this is kind of the basis of some of the work that we've published now almost two years ago, um, while I was still a postdoc at Stanford, 
um, which is using video-based artificial intelligence for assessment of ejection fraction. And this is work that I um, really appreciate. Um, Partho has highlighted and recognized and kind of described some of the real clinical applications and indications of what it can be used for. And I'll walk us through it. First, in machine learning, there is a task called semantic segmentation. This is something that is fairly standardized over the last five years, which is using algorithms to do pixel to pixel labeling of a picture. This is most important in something like self-driving cars, where one night needs to recognize in the left-hand side of the picture, whether it's a pedestrian, it's a car, or it's simply the pavement, because that really changes what we do with the information. It's not just detecting that there is a pedestrian or detecting there is a car in the picture, um, but really where does that localize to and where is that information from? This is actually the same task we do when we do any kind of contouring or segmentation in medical imaging. For example, when tracing the ejection fraction, one traces the left ventricle at end systole and end diastole. One needs to know where the boundary is and where the chamber is. We use this type of deep learning algorithm, particularly one with atrious convolutions, which I won't talk too much about in the context of this talk, um, to really to do frame level and image level um, segmentation of where the left ventricle is. Because we can do this with an algorithm, we can do this at scale and for every beat on every frame of the video. And this is what we're showing. And both on the left-hand side, high quality images that has a very clear detail on where the uh, myocardium starts and when the endocardium ends, as well as low quality videos, which even by a human eye might be hard, but we can actually try and estimate where it is. Using the Deep Lab V3 algorithm, we're actually able to show that we can do semantic segmentation. And this is robust across the video so that we can actually do this for every beat and assess the change in ejection fraction or the change in size and volume across multiple beats frame by frame. And ultimately, this goes back to the clinical indication and the clinical reason why we want to do something like this. We recognize as clinicians that there are indications and there are times where there is significant variation. By automating a tedious task, one can actually create a more precise measurement. And that's what we actually show here in the example of a patient in sinus, as well as a patient in atrial fibrillation. If you look at the video of the patient in atrial fibrillation, particularly a very short beat causes the estimate of the EF to be really low, but a really long beat can exaggerate the ejection fraction estimate. And it's only when we estimate over five beats, we can actually create uh, the best or the most precise measurement. And this is what it's looking on, on the right-hand side, where we do have the volume at every frame. And from this volume, we can actually have an assessment of the ejection fraction for every beat of the heart. And then we can actually average this over the course of the entire uh, video. Uh, we generally use a four-beat acquisition. So this four-beat acquisition is essentially showing that as we actually average more and more beats, it comes closer to the ground truth, which in this case was the expert evaluation. Even beyond evaluating ejection fraction, well, some of the work that we're currently working on is extending this to more complex features in echocardiography. And this is work that we're doing with kind of Martin, who I know that is now working here with Partho at Rutgers, as well as uh, Attila, who is kind of uh, still in Europe. Um, with a segmentation model, we can actually do and track additional features. One clear example is actually assessing for strain. Um, using the segmentation, we can actually evaluate the myocardium and actually evaluate strain in the same way. And we have a manuscript in review right now, which is doing beat by beat assessment of strain and seeing how this evaluates or essentially compares to proprietary uh, software workflows such as like TomTag and QLab. And ultimately, even beyond kind of traditional human measurements, Going back to the original premise is the idea that hopefully with artificial intelligence, we can actually get additional information from the images themselves. That even though clinicians are really good at identifying the most important features of which ejection fraction and strain are, um, there might be other features and other relationships that we haven't recognized yet. 
Um, this is another body of work that we've worked on over the last couple of years, which is, is there additional information in the images that clinicians don't necessarily use these images for, um, but an AI model can recognize? And on the right-hand side is something that I would say that no echocardiographer uses echo for, uh, but clearly there's a relationship, which is one can tell whether it's a male or female patient, whether it's an older patient or a younger patient, just by looking at the echo images. This is not the indication of the imaging study, but this can be a diagnostic workflow or a research workflow that helps us understanding what does accelerated aging looks like. What does it look like for, or what does it mean when a patient on images actually looks older than their stated age? We're, there's a whole body of literature where even in kind of clinical notes, we use the term um, older or younger than stated age, but may, that also applies for medical imaging. What does it mean when that happens? Is that prognostic? Does that actually have a lot of information? We hope it does. And part of the reason we think that is that this also helps us highlight the association with biomarkers. Things like anemia, as in an elevated BMP or troponin, are also signals that we can capture from the echocardiogram and hopefully in some ways actually show us a closer relationship from the deep learning interpretation to the actual disease state. Potentially, this can be a way that we can even uncover or even use deep learning to assess more complex traits and complex diagnoses, such as half path, which, you know, there's a tremendous workflow and requires a lot of expert evaluation and a lot of integration, a lot of information for a human to diagnose. The second talk, path of my talk is I'll talk about what does it mean when we use software and what are the opportunities if we can actually use technology at scale? One of the really other, one of the other really exciting avenues and opportunities that we're seeing in cardiovascular medicine right now is that genomic medicine is actually getting cheaper and cheaper. Over the course of essentially close to 30 years, um, the cost of a human genome is getting cheaper and cheaper. And now we're, we're near the place where potentially patients can come to us and be like, oh, I got these results from 23andMe. I actually got a whole genome sequenced or I have a whole exome sequenced. How do we clinically interpret that? How do we actually use that information? That's actually something that is still an open question, but I would posit is actually directly addressed by precision phenotyping. This is, as we look at genetics research, one of the things that is most important is the relationships with the genotype and phenotype. Just as genotyping is getting cheaper, phenotyping is not. We're not necessarily at the place where it's easy to phenotype large populations at the same scale that we can now readily essentially genotype whole populations in the same way. This is true by kind of how the research programs are going, such as the UK Biobank, in which kind of uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people are being sequenced, as well as in the United States, all of us. The bottleneck ultimately right now is actually at scale precision phenotyping. And at the same time is the importance of when we do things at scale, what does it mean to be precise? Ultimately, I would say that um, precision medicine, a big word or kind of a very hot phrase, requires both the combination of precision diagnosis and precision therapeutics. Uh, there's been a lot of thought about precision therapeutics, a lot of new therapies for rare diseases, um, but really how, what is our pipeline is our workflow to actually identify rare diseases. One disease that of, is of pers personal interest of me is the question of cardiac, or ca cardiac amyloidosis as well as hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. This is a particularly interesting, uh, I would say, disease state for imagers because there's a lot of phenotypic mim mimics, whether it's a patient with end-stage renal disease with long-standing hypertension or aortic stenosis, LV hypertrophy can have a broad differential, but the differential includes rare diseases that we often overlook. In fact, kind of the literature suggests that for a diagnosis of cardiac amyloid, often a patient needs to see at least four specialists, and it takes two to three years before the ultimate diagnosis. This is in contrast with the fact that we now have tremendously new and efficacious therapies, both for amyloids, things like tefaminous, as well as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, things like mavicamptin, that we really want to get into 
patients' hands because we recognize that there is a tremendous benefit. Our workflow is to automate the AI screening of these diseases. Um, this is a two-step process, which I'll walk, talk through, and this is a paper we recently published last month in JAMA Cardiology, um, which is first, we identify patients with hypertrophy. Using a similar deep learning segmentation algorithm, we train the algorithm to measure wall thickness, things like the, intern, uh, the intraventricular septum, as well as the posterior wall, things that are fairly simple, but I would say kind of humans still have significant variation in how we do. Um, actually can be automated and similarly can be measured beat by beat to, for a four beat acquisition averaged across to provide the most precise measurements. This allows for an assessment that is consistent and generalizes across um, essentially multiple studies in a more consistent manner than human measurements. This is a work that was co-led by Grant Duffy, Paul Chang, and Neil Yuan, as well as co-supervised uh, by Dr. Susan Chang here at Cedars. And this is what it looks like in comparison with human variation. On the right-hand side is actually the comparison of these measures of the, uh, the wall thicknesses um, between one study and the most subsequent prior study um, when the term no significant change or no change was detected. And we see that there is variation, that humans are pretty good at being consistent study to study, um, but that there is variation in what that measurement looks like. That said, on the right-hand side, when we actually use a deep learning approach that averages all the measurements across a study, um, we see that that variation study to study is much more limited, that it's much more consistent and precise across the, across the studies. This is true both from studies done at Stanford, as well as studies done at Cedars-Sinai, as well as we use, leverage a open source data set called the Unity Imaging Collaborative from the United Kingdom. This is an opportunity where we, as any technology gets more and more precise, we're more sensitive to uh, detecting change and we're more sensitive to recognizing when things are different. And that allows us to go to the next step of our algorithm, which is screening for actual cardiac amyloid and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We use an approach that CNNs or convolutional neural networks really is really good at, which is ultimately um, detecting texture or unique textures. This is something that's particularly exciting in cardiac amyloid because as kind of many of you guys know, in echo, particularly without um, or older echo machines, there is the hint or the recognition that the muscle texture has a big impact of, to that diagnosis. The star and night texture um, that is I think more present in earlier machines is something that potentially the AI algorithm can actually detect and look at in uh, more detail. We use this algorithm to actually find this and actually train an algorithm specifically to compare or to look differently between the different modalities, recognizing, again, this is a population where all of them are already hypertroph hypertrophs, um, but using the negative examples from, of HCM for, against the positive examples of cardiac amyloid to really tease apart and let the algorithm identify the differences between the multiple diseases. This is all really exciting. And I think that this is a place where one, um, I like to pause to really think about what should we do next? And is this enough? Obviously this is all research and it's not quite at the clinical stage yet, um, but this is a recognition that we still have some room to go. We did analysis uh, last year, which we showed that even for AI technologies approved by the FDA, um, it isn't necessarily still at the play stage for prime time of FDA approved technologies, of AI technologies. Most of it are still relatively small sample size. Very few are blinded, almost none are randomized, and most of the time use retrospective data. You can imagine this is not the same bar of evidence one uses when prescribing Entresto or prescribing any kind of medical or therapeutic. Um, and we do believe that with something as potentially uh, kind of transformative as AI, we should reach a similar bar. So, this goes to the kind of the next st stage of my talk, which we'll talk about kind of what does it look like for deployment, which is ultimately the gold standard of any technology of seeing how it, what happens when it actually impacts patient care. And this is kind of my slide to show that implementation really is key um, because e even when there's a really good technology, um, really how it influences or impacts patient care is ultimately what we really care about as clinicians. 
This example is actually, there's really pivotal work being done by our colleagues at Mayo, which kind of with papers in Nature Medicine, showing um, that the algorithm works really well. But in a randomized fashion, which they published just this year, this kind of workflow is only showing that it's able to identify 66 more patients in uh, on the order of kind of 20,000 patient population. Where do we identify the actual true effect of AI and where do we affect or understand how meaningful AI is, is an active area of further investigation. And this is kind of what we're hoping to do. Um, for our EF model, we're actually currently running a blinded trial to see what it looks like um, because it's a particularly unique opportunity in echocardiography, meaning that most echo labs undergo a workflow where it's a tracing done by a sonographer and then evaluated by a cardiologist, which really introduces the opportunity for blinding and randomization because it's a two human process. This is something that's really hard to do in most radiological, um, I would say, kind of studies or kind of technologies because it's really, there isn't someone doing it before you. But if we can actually blind the cardiologist to whether an, alg an algorithm or a sonographer is actually tracing something, we hope to truly identify what is the impact of an algorithm and tease it out from both the hype and the expectation. This is a clinical trial that we're currently enrolling <clears throat> or we're currently deploying and working on in which we've actually used historical images from uh, about 2019 uh, CEDARS and actually blind our blinding cardiologists to reevaluate them to whether that tracing is done by a sonographer or the new tracing is done by an AI technology. And this is really exciting because this allows for actually three points of comparison. One, obviously you can compare what the AI is doing versus what the sonographer is doing, how that affects whether the uh, kind of the cardiologist thinks this is correct or not correct. But also there's the point of comparison, which does that new adjudication, is that different from before? Is it if the sonographer traced it again um, from, is that different from the historical evaluation of ejection fraction or is it the same? And two, how much do ejection fraction adjudication change once adding an AI technology? By blinding this, by blinding cardiologists to this entire workflow, um, this allows us for the most precise point estimate of really what is human to human variation as well as human to AI variation. And ultimately, this is a part where it's tremendously important because as we've mentioned, the ejection fraction assessment in blindness studies in the past have been variable. This is really important, particularly for things like cardio-oncology, in which even subtle changes, as we're kind of adjudicating, particularly for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, um, really helps or really makes a big impact on the patient care, whether they go get downstream chemotherapy or need additional adjunctive interventions. The second prospective trial that we're currently running is essentially prospective validation of our workflow to screen for cardiac amyloid. CEDARS uh, in our ECHO database has about 300,000 echocardiograms. And you can see that this is the histogram with a notable uh, drop during the beginning of COVID. Um, but what we're actually doing is that we're actually running our AI workflow for screening for amyloid across the entire enterprise and seeing if we can identify more patients. This is something that I would say that kind of there's increasing recognition that amyloid is an unrare, rare disease where everything from about uh, 10 to 15% of TAVR patients might also have been common amyloid to a population level prevalence that's much higher than what we're traditionally seeing at tertiary care center um, really gives us the suspicion that potentially we can identify more patients with cardiac amyloid. This is a trial that we're working with, with kind of Lily Stern, one of our star cardiology fellows, who's actually going to do advanced heart failure next year, as well as Jig Patel, who's our amyloid expert here at Cedars. On the left-hand side is our initial overview of the patients we've screened, where on the x-axis is the model suspicion for amyloid to not amyloid. From zero on the left-hand side, where most of the patients are, meaning that the model is not concerned about amyloid at all, to a long tail on the right-hand side, where a proportion of our patients, the model is suspicious for cardiac amyloid. And on the bottom, we see this is actually comparing 
with our known amyloid patients from JIG's kind of amyloid cohort, where are they actually in our distribution? What does it look like when we haven't even done much screening, but just to look like what it looks like on historical controls? And we see that most of the amyloid patients at CEDARS actually filter up to the top of our algorithm, which is, uh, I would say, kind of very reassuring and really helpful for us to have confidence and excitement for the trial. And that's why it's currently unrolling. Um, we've um, kind of enrolled three patients right now, but on the left hand or on the right hand side is actually you can see where it currently looks like, where the orange are the patients that need to be screened, um, but the red are actually patients that we actually look through and actually either didn't see uh, Dr. Patel or was someone that was already known to have amyloid uh, in the system and is actually in our kind of amyloid database. This is incredibly exciting and hopefully essentially expands the opportunity for treatment for these rare diseases. And ultimately kind of all end here, um, but I want to say that that is really the paradigm that I see for artificial intelligence, where it's really the combination of human intelligence and artificial intelligence that brings kind of the best in terms of patient care and the best opportunities. Most of us are incredibly busy and have a really robust, uh, I would say, kind of uh, kind of clinical workflow. But really, sometimes it does help to have a diagnostic nudge or a diagnostic um, uh, aid to help us identify patients that we should take an additional closer eye to look at, or really help us um, really kind of, uh, I would say, adjudicate someone that's a really tough or kind of at the intermediary that gives us a sense of whether it should be actually a little bit more or a little bit less in terms of direction fraction. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity and really excited and happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Uh, I think um, we will come to a spotlight mode. Uh, if you, uh, David, are able to um, free us up from the last slide. So I think Dr. Daniel Schindler and uh, we'll have Dr. Navina Yanmala join and, and and I want to just uh, mention that Dr. Schindler started doing some work um, long, some time back in technology. So Dan, just walk us through with your comments and what you think is uh, your um, take from what David presented, and then we can have a, some. I have some questions in mind. I can also present. Sure. So I think basically you're preaching to the choir, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we started this uh, when a medical student walked in. Uh, uh, I think it was like 1996, is, hey, I trained with Bjarn Stirps of the guy who uh, invented C++. So we started neural networks uh, with uh, pixel analysis, but then we uh, branched off to actually doing integrated backscatter, so we're grabbing the uh, live signal from the back of the echo machine. And uh, one of our PhD uh, people uh, at Rutgers Biomedical used a neural uh, network uh, algorithm called Allopex, invented in Rutgers. Um, wrote a PhD thesis on dobutamine stress echoes. So we did that here. And then after that, uh, there's a guy named Ross Quinlan who did the C45 uh, 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 rules, uh, inductive decision trees uh, work. And Ross was using us, he was saying, hey, yeah, go to New Brunswick, they're doing uh, stuff. I'm in Australia, you have to go to New Jersey. So we were actually predicting uh, uh, incidence of pericardial uh, admissions. So we, we got climate data from the New Jersey climatologist, and we're able to predict seasonal occurrence of pericarditis uh, using his uh, uh, rules-based algorithm, okay? What drives me crazy now is the fact that doctors don't know how to listen with a stethoscope. Uh, triple rhythm versus quadruple rhythm, you know, just basically, you know, they, they know PC Richards uh, uh, jargon, uh, uh, they know the Intel quadruple, they know Beethoven, but they can't hear an S4 or an S3, okay? So I think artificial intelligence will have a role there. I've been, as governor, I really pitched to the ACC that they really need to own the stethoscope. And I think artificial intelligence, helping doctors listen to heart sounds is something you guys, you the young, you know, I'm the old guy. So, you know, help the new generation doctors here in S3 is my commentary, okay? <laughs> Well, I think, uh, Dan, I think this is uh, great that um, someone, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing that uh, sometimes technology, uh, perception of the technology and the timing when it comes through and 
is available for a mainstream application is so very important, right? So you were doing something some time back and for it to surface out to the mainstream, it, I mean, so neural network has been done there for some time. I mean, I mean you know, and David, so it's, it's just amazing that you need like, uh, as you pointed out in your initial, the tip of the iceberg of things come, there are all that goes behind and then there's that opportune time when it comes and your paper in uh, uh, nature uh, medicine and, and subsequently, I think uh, deep learning and the ability to scale and the computational speed has allowed it to kind of come to the forefront. So it's amazing. So I wanted to bring after your talk also Dr. Schindler and to just see and get a compare and contrasting version of what work has happened in the past. So thanks, uh, Dan, for stating that. And also then now we have Dr. Yan Mala, uh, who's here and he's been working some of the projects ourselves. Um, now, let me let me ask by uh, starting off, um, uh, David, a question to you. What do you think is the holy grail um, parameter towards which the heart works? See, I mean, what I'm saying, like you, you trained it to look at the ejection fraction, but someone else is going to come back and say that, well, EF doesn't work, right? I mean, it's interesting, right? So, and the reason I'm asking you this question is, how much are you impressed about supervised versus the need for unsupervised learning? Yeah, I think that's, it, it's a fantastic question. And I think um, as Partho, you've mentioned it, um, when we get three different cardiologists, uh, we might have 10 different interpretations. And that is one of the challenges, particularly with supervised work. Um, as cardiologists, we do recognize that there are limitations with most of the measures we do, um, whether it's ejection fraction or strain. Uh, so uh, potentially kind of just the diagnosis or kind of recognizing if someone is in heart failure or where even potentially cardiac output might be something that we hope to do in the future, um, but it is kind of still potentially hard with machine learning because I, I would still say that the easiest or the highest throughput is still supervised machine learning. While there's a lot of opportunities for unsupervised machine learning, um, I would say that that tends to be a place where if cardiologists can't agree, how do we actually get essentially computer algorithms to agree? And what kind of downstream work do we need to do to really validate the clusters or to validate the additional work that these algorithms are doing? I think it, it becomes a, a chicken and egg type of situation, but I'm optimistic that we can actually uh, do more in the future to really tease that out. So I want to bring in uh, Dr. Yanmala also to vein in some of her comments and, uh, and then maybe we can have another round of questions. Thank you, David. That was a very nice presentation. You know, you opened your talk with the first slide saying a picture is worth a thousand words, right? I do come from the other field, a computer science field, not a clinician or a cardiologist. So for us, uh, you know, when we have ResNet, ImageNet, all of these things that we use for deep learning training, the field comes from object detection. And every picture tells a story, right? A boy with a ball on a sunny day is a, is a summarization of a picture. So when you were presenting your models, one thing was going on in my mind, they seeing, saying that cardiologists and sonographers and echocardiographers actually look at each image and this single image has much more information content, right? It's medical images are not just pictures, but they are rich data sources. That's how I look at it. And then, and every single image can actually be mapped to multiple parameters related to the heart, as well as multiple clinical conditions itself. So what is the possibility that these grayscale images can actually tell a story about a patient? And you have beautiful report, you can predict age, sex, different parameters of the heart. Can actually, these techniques, do you think in the future could be combined and integrated to actually tell a story about a patient? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. I think that's why I'm so intrigued and my personal interest is in imaging. Um, I would say that kind of, as an imager, and I think that this is this borns out in kind of a couple of studies that have been published recently, is that most cardiologists like to look at the echo themselves as opposed to looking at the report. And I think that this is probably true both for kind of Partho as Dan, as well as others, because we do wanna see what it looks like. There's some kind of gestalt or there's additional information beyond what's really reported. And sometimes, you know, it might be a colleague of ours that we respect a lot, but maybe we slightly disagree on what that evaluation looks like. 
I think ultimately that relationship of what that story is, is still requires expert interpretation, um, but hopefully kind of we can get the AI to bring us closer to that story. So, um, you know, I have additional question continuing your conclusion that you have just given. So, um, you know, again, uh, our thought process, right, when you think about perceptrons, so deep learning is all about perceptrons and neurons. So it's a single siloed neural network model. But human thinking, right? I mean, I actually see Dr. Sen Gupta sometimes evaluating echoes, right? His decision of going from an A4C to a parasitical long axis or shifting back to a short axis depends upon different patients, right? Now I'm actually motivated by human intelligence and mimicking a, a machine intelligence models, right? So when a human intelligence is actually driven by the consequences of the situation at the right time, in the right mode, and the right patient, right? It's driven by a bit by that. And how do you think that would play into play a role in developing deep learning models for cardiology? Yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting work done outside of, say, cardiovascular imaging, um, but in AI, where there's really kind of multimodal AI, which is integrating a lot of information. And as you've mentioned, kind of potentially that could be other features from the echoes from different views, or could be even integrating kind of the presentation, the essentially the lab work and other things to really come up with the clinical scenario. I think this is work that is still early, but really promising. Okay, my last question. Sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> this was the first talk I actually got me excited in all the grand rounds. So I have to say that. So clinical decision-making, if I see in a mathematics form as a variable or a function of three variables, different diagnosis possible, from the same amount of information that you can get, uh, the risk of uh, outcomes associated with each disease. And the, uh, the last parameter is the amount of information that a clinician has to gather to correctly make a decision making, clinical decision making. So it's a complex scenario, of course. So, um, and I, knowing that the medical errors, especially diagnostic errors, is the third largest cause of death in the United States. And we also know that. The human element is the greatest variation in clinical decision making. How do you think AI or models could actually influence, could benefit that or could bring us back? Yeah, I, I would definitely say, you know, AI is still early. So a lot of these technologies, I would definitely still say is decision support. It's where ultimately I think physicians should be in the, I would say the driver's seat, but it does show opportunities to especially smooth out some of these variations. So kind of I've shown that figure where the distribution of <clears throat> the EFs reported in, say like our database is very jagged. If I actually run the algorithm on all the studies of the last couple of years, it ends up showing actually a smooth algorithm or a smooth distribution by using algorithms to actually, uh, I would say de-bias what kind of essentially the interpretation should be that actually potentially allows us to be more precise. And I think that that's um, really what I'm hoping to show is that I think the closest things are things that are point measurements that cardiologists can either agree with or disagree with, which is just like the ejection fraction or kind of the wall thickness. Things like actually coming up with a diagnosis, I think is maybe still not quite there yet, but requires additional work. Thanks, Dr. Singh. Very good. So, um, and uh, David, so I think uh, your work is very fascinating. So I still get uh, very intrigued. Um, uh, by the amount of variance that you see even with the experts, right? Um, so I wonder whether, uh, for example, I mean, it's just the uh, the variability, just you cannot kill it. It will, it, it will probably continue to exist. Uh, there is also on top of that, the physiological variability, because I think a dynamic variability of the heart is a good sign. Um, the minute it becomes more fixed, so EF becomes fixed, that means that system is going to fail, right? Because that means there is no variance. Well, I mean, uh, but I, I do want to bring in again back what Navina and we've been talking about. So uh, like even in an in a, in a echocardiographic interpretation, we are not so much in at least me, I'm not so much dependent on numbers of what uh, numbers that like uh, one, one number here or there uh, doesn't bother me because what I'm saying is like, I think, we correct them, right? Because we look for that that continuity of the information or what Navina calls as the story. 
like running through the images and looking at the story that is coming out or what this could be. And moreover, I think when each and each one of us evaluates, we are like screaming out, why is this echo being done, right? So we always need a central question that's causing that echo to be done, or we are always, without that direction in going through the imaging, it, it's very discomforting. So I know, uh, I think Dr. Bari is there and other people are there. I think we all want to know uh, whenever, why is this being done, right? Because imagine without that being, it causes you to become very uncomfortable when you want to read the echo because you don't want, so which means like we are, there is a theme that we are looking for at least, or we need an angle or a lens through which those images are going to be looked into. Yeah. So, so, so with that regard, I think the measurements, I, we don't really do, depend upon too much of measurements because we can still, still tell a story. So having said that, why is it so necessary to be precise with measurements? So I think this is a really good question and I think it really hits the, uh, the, the I would say the, the, the nail on its head, which is why do we do medical imaging? I have two points to make here. And the first is that the reason why I think we really care about the indication is because there's just so much information, right? With an echo study, there can be kind of a uh, hundred series or 200 series when the sonographer is particularly careful. Um, but is that all information that we really need or is we is absolutely necessary? And kind of if I were reading a chemotherapy study versus an endocarditis study, I'm really looking at very different things human attention is incredibly fatigable and is incredibly, uh, I would say kind of, it becomes incredibly hard if you actually need to spend an hour with every study, it's really not scalable. That said, I think that is really the potential for AI to really highlight where the variance is and where things are different. Because I would say that kind of a lot of what we do even now as a second point is, is essentially comparisons. The EF was reported as 45 this time, but was 55 last time. I go back and take a look, is it visually different? And that difference um, when we can actually identify change really comes from when we can have precision. If we don't have precision, we just eyeball and just look, well, it looks roughly the same. I'll just say the same or I'll fudge the number so it comes a little bit closer to what it said in the past it is essentially the clinical standard now. But if we are able to be more precise and we are able to actually quantify more things I think that we can identify uh, things earlier. We can identify change, which ultimately for a lot of our studies is what we're going after. And, and do you think um, given the, um, so I'm, uh, we are still spending a lot of time in diagnosing and very limited time in therapy planning, right? Or at least there is a very limited time available for therapy planning, given the paradigm of the official, I mean, AI is definitely good good tool for efficiency. So that makes perfect sense that you can free up time for most of your interpretation, which is currently not there. So that's how I at least take that, you know, if you can do me all the measurements, I don't need to do those manual tracings, right? I mean, we can, uh, but, but for the future, um, how do you think we should be designing our clinical trials in terms of prospective studies? Because all the work that has happened so far are retrospective because we've just been training and trying to develop. But what are the, tell, tell us what kind of prospective future clinical trial, when should we go into venturing into randomized decision-making uh, use of, I mean, we don't have that evidence as yet, right? What is, what is your thoughts about the future of clinical studies, clinical trials and AI? Yeah, I would say that I think a lot of it really depends on the prior workflow or the prior history. Kind of one example I often give is that if you look at not AI, but other kinds of technologies, things like MRIs, really there's no randomized trial of MRIs, but we read them every day and we use them incredibly, um, I think, to change decision-making. Similar for DGE or any of the pulse sequences, or um, there's no prospect of randomization, but we do show that there's a clear relationship between what it looks like versus a clinical outcome. And that's really, I think that the, the bar AI needs. That said, that link between diagnosis and therapeutics is where I think is the weakest bar, where kind of, you know, we've seen in heart failure trials, 
it's essentially many, just most recently, just with the SGLT2 inhibitors, there's therapeutics that work, but there's many therapeutics that don't work. Maybe it's because the inclusion criteria is not precise enough. Maybe it's because our definition of HEFPAP is not very good. And if we had better diagnostics, we have better buckets to put patients into, that might even change how we do essentially therapeutic, uh, essentially RCTs. Very good. Any other closing, uh, any comments, uh, Dan, from you or Navina? Anything else? I was just going to say behind you, there is a copy of the Hearst. So uh, if you take a look at uh, a Sengupta talk, Dr. Sengupta will show you the exponential number of uh, publications on, on different things, how things change, how thousands. Here's my question. So there are basically all old cardiologists like me have a pile of Jack issues that we didn't get to reading. So medical knowledge, AI and medical knowledge, what do you have to say about that? And that's how to use a artificial intelligence to make a doctor smarter with all those publications, with everything that's being published, how do you help a doctor access the right information at the right time when he's seeing a patient? Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. I think that we're all kind of increasingly busy and there's always more and more information. I think that that's why even in EHRs, if it's not AI, there's more and more nudges, right? More things like, hey, have you considered doing this? Or this patient isn't on DVT prophylaxis. Let's make sure they're on it. I think that is really what medicine being practiced in the future will look like as we really want to optimize the care for every patient. Very good. I think this has been a great discussion. I think the future is going to be very interesting to see that evolving. And uh, we look forward to collaborating with you, David, and, and others uh, uh, Martin, from with whom you have worked, is already here. He's just joined recently. So hopefully we can develop a bridge uh, of uh, collaboration. Um, thank you very much and look forward to seeing your publications uh, coming out in the near future. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.